The Vancouver Island Economic Alliance is all about achieving a vital and sustainable island region economy. We collaborate with stakeholders to solve problems and promote opportunities. Every October, VAIA hosts the State of the Island Economic Summit, a meeting place for ideas where you can network with decision makers and be informed of relevant grassroots trends in the island economy. VAIA's annual economic report is the only publication of its kind in Canada. It is user-friendly and puts important timely data at your fingertips. Foreign Trade Zone Vancouver Island provides ready access to Canada's duty and tax deferral opportunities and attracts foreign direct investment to the island region. And the Island Good brand created by VAIA makes it easy for shoppers to find local products and is proven to increase sales for island producers. If it's Island Good, whether it's potatoes or gin or mattresses, it's good for our economy, good for sustainability, and good for us all. VAIA, a nonprofit membership organization that leads creation of transformative economic opportunities. Hello everyone and welcome to our next session in the industry speaker series here at Seaweed Days. And I'd like to recognize VAIA for um, uh, supporting this, this particular series as part of the festival. We're very grateful to uh, utilize their platform to, to deliver the, the speaker series as we have folks coming in from all over the world to, to speak to us during the seven days of seaweed. My name is Erin and I am the Manager of Communications and Engagement at Cascadia Seaweed. I will be the host of your session today. Uh, for those of you who have joined multiple sessions, you're probably getting tired of me saying that. Maybe I will stop tomorrow on day three of Seaweed Days. <laughs> Um, so today we have a very interesting um, presentation, one that I have been looking forward to, more of a conversation with Larry Johnson from New Chalmette Seafoods. Before I uh, welcome Larry on screen here, I would like to just tell you a little bit about him and his background and experience. Larry is the president of New Chalmette Seafood Development Corporation. He's the current chairman of Mammoth Treaty Fisheries Committee, former Huayat Director of Lands and Natural Resources and International Halibut Commissioner. Larry has been an integral part to the successful integration of First Nations and Western resource management systems and brings a unique perspective to fisheries, fisheries management issues. Larry participates in the First Nations Fisheries Council Aquaculture Coordinating Committee, and as a member of DFO's Indigenous Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Board on Aquaculture. A personal undertaking of Indigenous fisheries and actively involved with treaty nations, recreational and commercial fisheries has enabled Larry to bring a unique perspective to fisheries management and aquaculture development. As president of New Chalmette Seafoods Limited Partnership, Larry has conducted years of engagement on aquaculture development with government and industry and is recognized as a leader in the sector. Understating that the future of seafood in the balance of wild and farmed, Larry supports the development of a blue economy to bring Canada back as a global leader in seafood. Larry is flexible, versatile, poised and competent with a demonstrated ability to easily transcend cultural differences, which I, uh, I truly respect and I have learned so much from, from Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson, would you like to join us? There you are. Great. Thanks, uh, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Utlama Anitsachist, Histakshatla Hu'eyat. My English name is Larry Johnson. I come from the Hu'eyat First Nations. I'm the president of Nuchana Seafoods Limited Partnership with shareholders that are Nuchana Nations that are from the west coast of Vancouver Island, and they are Dot First Nations, the Hu'eyat First Nations, the Cayuca Chekwesit First Nations, the Chekwesit Tribe Government, and the Yisluathlaat First Nations. Um, we also do, uh, um, so what we do is that we offer uh, fisheries management support to our shareholding nations, their fishers, entrepreneurs, and various aspects of fisheries development. Specifically, we do things like uh, feasibility studies, business plans, vessel purchases, license and quota purchases, aquaculture ventures, and partnerships. Uh, why do we do this? We do it because uh, uh, we want to stay connected to our ocean resources and build capacity within our nations. Um, you know, by doing that, we all breathe life back into the West Coast communities on, uh, out of uh, Vancouver Island. Um, part of our success, I think, is, is that we've embraced the three sacred principles that we uh, channel principles and they're Hishuk, Tzawak, everything is one and everything is connected. Isak, which is a greater respect with caring. A lot of people just think it's respect. It's not, it's much more than that. It's how you conduct yourself. It's how you expect people to treat you. And then the final uh, principle is Uafak, to take care of with a modern approach. To me, when you combine all of those principles, that's what it means to me to be a Hu'ayat First Nation person. And so um, I take it very seriously and have brought it into uh, our, our, our uh, Nuchanath uh, Seafood Limited Partnership. We use these principles to guide us through our strategic planning because we like to plan, you know, several years out in advance. Um, to guide us through our strategic planning, we use it to implement our plans, our day to day management. Oh, excuse me, my battery's running low. I got to plug in. So we use these uh, principles to remind us that we're working for uh, seven generations and without what we do has to be sustainable. And when I say sustainable, I'm not talking about sustainable business because that's much different. We want the, the resources and mother earth and what we're doing there to be sustainable so that it's there for seven generations. <clears throat> Michana Seafood has had a lot of success in, in business partnerships, developing mutually beneficial partnerships with companies that align with our traditional values. Those partnerships provide financial benefits and investment opportunities and capacity building opportunities for our company and for our shareholders. Um, for example, a very uh, important moment in Nuchana Seafood's history was in at the end of 2015, we purchased majority shares in St. Jean's. Um, that was uh, quite an undertaking. We had a strategy of retained earnings that our, our, our shareholding nations had, uh, had uh, totally supported and, and, and could see the vision of it. And so on year three of our five-year retained earnings, we started to look at what we would invest in. Uh, in terms of uh, um, our larger strategic plan. And so we looked at uh, processing plants, we looked at primary processing plants, we looked at St. Jean's, we looked at some smaller ones, we looked at large fish boats, we looked at smaller fish boats. We were trying to find ways to grow our company because eventually we wanted to become a vertically integrated seafood company that, um, that is diversified, um, that could use this as a, an approach to telling our story. So when we purchased uh, St. Jean's and partnered with the previous owner, and that was probably one of the biggest keys for us was to be able to secure um, an agreement with Gerard St. Jean, uh, the, the owner uh, of St. Jean's. And so we, we structured a deal where uh, he would retain and keep 15% of his company. And while we bought 85%, it 
but over three years, we would purchase his shares out and become 100% owners. Um, and, and so, you know, that was really important for us because we didn't want to upset what Gerard had accomplished because he put together a business that was his family values, his family, hard blood, sweat and tears went into this, this company. And uh, we, we really wanted to make sure it stayed intact, that the success that he enjoyed would still be there. And that part of our traditions and culture is to build on successes. And so we wanted to see where we could take and what we could do with St. Jean's when we have his vision, our vision and working together. So as we partnered uh, with the previous owner, we increased uh, access to processing for our, 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 na our nation's members. And uh, this provided Nuchana Seafood with the experience in brand development and marketing and sales and employment opportunities. And that's another good point is that we, we didn't want to upset what Gerard had done. And we wanted to give the employees some uh, uh, comfort in knowing that uh, we're not changing the direction of this company. And we wanted to let the, the, the recreational sector, the sport fishing sector know that this uh, company that has done so much for them uh, would still be there for them. So we wanted to make sure that that, that happened because St. Jean's is the largest uh, sports fish processor in Canada. Um, one other thing that happened after we purchased was about two weeks before we made the announcement, we found out that uh, uh, Jimmy Patterson had closed his cannery up in Prince George, making St. Jean's the last standing cannery in British Columbia. And so we service sport fish, wild and farm fish processing and have retail sales in, in our St. Jean's and Rain Coast trading brands. Again, just making that, that note, we didn't want to disrupt the business that Gerard had already um, um, accomplished. So our strategic plan has had uh, already identified that aquaculture as an increasing uh, and important opportunity necessary for the future of seafood in British Columbia and Canada. Um, our nations had shellfish tenures that were in various stages and some of which were, so were just sitting dormant. And so we, we really looked hard uh, at, at what we could do with the fallow tenures. Um, so all the while also, uh, you know, creating uh, relationships and partnerships. So we ended up doing some custom processing with some of the aquaculture companies during this COVID time last year. And, and we were able to help, you know, food banks and, and uh, uh, partners of, of these uh, fish farm companies. So, you know, where I see the future is wild and farm together uh, combined as BC sustainable seafood. I'd like to see Canada go back to its number one position. Um, I think where we've slid down to number eight, we're using about percent or less than one percent of our coastline. Um, and and so so there's huge opportunity there for us. <clears throat> so. In the past, uh, we were using the expertise with St. Jean's. We launched uh, uh, Gratitude Seafood, an authentic Aboriginal seafood product line. This will tell our First Nation story through seafood. And so, you know, having said that we didn't want to disrupt what Gerard had built, we really wanted to get to this, this point where we were telling our story, our story of how long we've been here. Um, and I think that that story would be our certification. So we wouldn't have to try to achieve some other type of certification. That's our story. We've been here since the beginning of time. We're gonna be here till the end of time, as far as we know. Uh, so, so at any rate, we wanna tell our story through, through our seafood. Um, and, and so we, we hired a company from down in the States and we looked at the marketing trends. And, and we found that our target would be uh, uh, youth. Um, 
young people who like to read labels and 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 are on YouTube and and are looking at at this world differently than than through the lens that I grew up in. You know, so so it's really interesting to 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 listen and uh, to to hear the expertise of people who watch these trends. Now, for me, I I want to tell our story. I want to have it through seafood. But those mechanics of how to get there, you really need to hire the experts. And that's what we did. We hired a company that, that assisted us. We, we went through lists of names and, and landed on gratitude. Because gratitude is something, and, and we didn't come by that uh, um, like right away. We, we went and visited our shareholding nations. We went to talk with them. This is important. Communications is really, really, really important when, when, when starting business, and especially when building a relationship with First Nations. You want you you need to get to know who your partner is. You need to find out where the common ground is. And, and so you know, uh, um, we we had these lists of names, and and the the first couple that we picked didn't even turn out turn up, and and you know. Um, we ended up coming back to gratitude, which was, was one of the ones that I identified right away that I liked. However, you know, uh, we, we went with uh, other ones just, just because of the way the report came back to us from our, our, our marketing folks. And so one of the common things that really happened was when we visited each nation and we asked the elders and the people who were sharing songs and meals with us, what was important to them? And what we found was uh, that um, the importance was, uh, excuse me for a second. Feel free to keep the questions. Excuse me, we had people coming in and I just didn't want to disrupt. Uh, so we, we were talking about gratitude seafood and all the different names. We went through the nations. And, and the one that really stuck out for me was this elder lady from the Chukwisa tribe. And she just really wanted people to get along. And they were so grateful that we came to, to visit with them, that we shared some meals with them, and that we talked about you know, what's important to the First Nations. And, and so one of the reoccurring themes was gratitude. And, and in our language, we have a, a a word called it it sort of means gratitude but it's much more than that so it was a really really good fit and and i like the the, um, the cover of the theme for seaweed days it has two hands that's what our our um, our gratitude seafood is is that it has the two hands incorporated into it so that uh, we're describing uh, some of the thoughts and feelings that our shareholding nations had. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about partnerships and, and, and building relationships. Um, I can go back into, into my past when I, I started off as a young counselor for, for my nation. And this was back in the 90s. And, and we were looking at uh, forestry as an unsustainable practice because they were taking a million cubic meters out of our very small territory. That was only, excuse me, 17% of the tree farm license. So what we found was that uh, we were in treaty negotiations at the time. So we, we negotiated what they call an interim measures agreement. And basically uh, it it's an agreement that says that while we negotiate for our lands and industry is out there working on them, that it would force industry and the Ministry of Forests to work together, almost like a forced relationship. <laughs> but we used that time and took the opportunity to explain who we were to, to McMillan Blodell, and that's the name of the company. God, it's been a long time since we heard that name. And, and so, you know, uh, um, my... Uh, my first day on the job, my chief counselor gave me about two feet worth of forest practice code books and says, you, you need to get up on, up to speed on this stuff because, and here I am a fisherman, I'm not a forester. Um, so I looked at those books and I kind of got intimidated and I thought, hmm, I'm gonna pick up the phone. And I phoned my contact at, at McMillan Blodell 
and I ask, what is it you need from me? What's my role here from your perspective? And so he explained to me and I sorted it out that my role really was to, to, to protect our Aboriginal rights. And, and so consequently, what, what that did for us was we started to have meetings once a week, 7 a.m. And we started to work with industry to find what common grounds that we had, get to know each other, if you will, over a meal, because that's part of our teachings too, is, is to, to be taking in food as, as we're exchanging information. That way we know you're listening with the two ears God gave you, and the one mouth that you got. So we, we went through a uh, time, we talked through challenges, really tough issues that, that you know, and, and those are the things that, that, that really, you know, make or break a relationship. If you can get through the tough issues, you can get through uh, and build an agreement of mutual benefit. And that's where we ended up. And, and so when we, you know, I remember asking governments back in those days, if you're logging a million cubic meters out of our territory, how about a couple of bucks per cubic meter? I mean, our number was four, we wanted 10, <laughs> but, Governments were afraid to set a precedence. So we thought, okay, we're getting no there. We're so, we're, so we went back over to industry and we talked to industry. Industry had the same issue. They were worried, precedence. So consequently, you know, we had to be uh, um, thinking outside the box and we had to move these discussions along. Otherwise people were entrenched in their positions. And so we started to think, well, you know, Money per cubic meter is good, but what, what other benefits? Well, we need jobs. We need training. We need to build capacity. We need a revenue stream. And so, so we ended up, uh, um, you know, working with them and, and creating a, a partnership that allowed us to um, look at some of our principles. Our, our, our chief at the, uh, at the time when he was, he was alive, he, would, he was saying very simple. What you take out, you must put back in. And, and so we kept bringing that message there and, and trying to find a way. And, and what we ended up doing was we found that you can harvest the laws. We want to be the ones planting the trees back. So we negotiated that. And we got a half a million trees and I had no idea what we were getting into. But, you know, we, we figured it out and we figured it out together with industry. And that's the message today is industry and First Nations can do a lot of good work together. And if you organize it strategically, you can go to the governments and make it easy for them. Make it easy for them to say yes. Yeah, mind you, you have, to, you have to take the time to communicate it properly so that they understand where you're coming from. Because that's what we have to do to industry. And so now, we, now all of a sudden we've got a three-way agreement where everyone is agreeing and it's like, Wow, so we, we ended up with a, um, a tree planting contract out of that first year. The next contract we got was for 30,000 cubic meters of salvage wood. And you know, I'm, I'm not sure if people have any idea of what, what that is, but that's a lot of, like we were gonna do shake blocks. That's a lot of shake blocks. And, and so, you know, we, we kept working together. We kept meeting monthly um, and it plays right into our principles of connecting making that connection, connect, connect, make that uh, relationship, uh, ESOC, have it with uh, respect. And, and, you know, when I talk about respect, um, I think about it and, and, and it's much more than that. Um, if I'm having a bad day, I shouldn't be tell I shouldn't be making you feel bad because of my bad day. That's respect for you. So, so then that, so then that incorporates that, and then the uothic to take care of. I want to, I want to incorporate that into this discussion too, because relationships aren't built in a day. Sometimes it takes years, and but you know what? It takes commitment to sit there and talk through the tough stuff, so that when you find that common ground, you can move forward, and you can move forward, and it gets exciting then. So, so I just wanted to be able to say that, you know, connecting the principles to, to building a relationship gets to a partnership. And, and, and so that relationship 
making sure you maintain that relationship, work with that relationship, that's taking care of it, u'asa. And, and so, you know, I just wanted to make that emphasis there. So when, when I wanted to um, uh, get back to, to the focus of today, which is seaweed days, um, we had uh, uh, significant challenges and some of our greatest opportunities lay within aquaculture. So I say aquaculture in BC today, uh, people think you're talking about fish farms. Well, it's much broader than that. There's fish farms, there's, there's shellfish aquaculture, there's kelp aquaculture now. So our strategic plan identified aquaculture uh, as an increasing and important opportunity for our shareholders. So we went and communicated with our nations about what we had ideas on. And, and, and again, the communication key, being transparent, key. So we, we talked to our nations and we found uh, um, that um, most had shellfish aquaculture on the go already. So we were looking at, uh, um, um, we went and partnered with industry and we filed up, uh, uh, filled in an application for an insert grant, which we were awarded and we partnered with North Island College we identified five sites uh, from our shareholding nations uh, fallow tenures. And of those five sites, we, we put down pilot or, or test strings, I should say, uh, with seed, seed on these lines. And, and so it was all new, new stuff for me to learn and really quite interesting. So of those five sites, uh, we found that out of those five, two of them actually produced some, some pretty good kelp. And so, um, um, we, we started down that path and we found that if we put the line from the top to the bottom, we could identify where the, the good growing area was. We took salinity and temperature. Um, so we could find and identify the, the best areas for this opportunity to grow. And so in the end, we found that the two of the five sites were good. So there in light, the next challenge was for New China Seafood to go to our nations and, and sort out, you know, which which uh, tenures would be the best opportunity for us. Meanwhile, we've gone to the seafood show up in Comox and, and some people were saying, you got to meet these guys, you got to meet these guys. And so through some great efforts of others, uh, I was able to, to meet Bill. Um, Cascadia, and we, we sat down and uh, had a chat, uh, and uh, that chat led to more chats and a few other meetings, and, and we realized that our, our values aligned, and, and their approach was solid from my perspective, that they wanted to, to partner with First Nations and build a sector. And so I, I thought, wow, what a great opportunity. I mean, typically First Nations are sitting on the outside looking in, Meanwhile, here we were, we had an opportunity to be in the grassroots and start with some, some, some people that have experience in the technologies and, and, and the knowledge of the, the infrastructures that would be needed. So we, we ended up uh, signing a partnership with Cascadia uh, and uh, with a plan now to revitalize our, our nation's tenures. Um, so this gave us a hands-on experience for our nation's members in anchoring, seeding, and growing kelp. And I wanna mention something here that First Nations people, anything to do with the ocean or a marine environment and that is hands-on, we excel in that area. And so, so that, that was really, really good to, good for, uh, this was a good project for our nations, a really good fit. So it, it answered some much needed employment and mentoring. Um, we hired several of our neighboring nations to, to assist us with setting up the infrastructure. And so, you know, when I talk about the infrastructure, that's your anchors, your lines, your seeds, your floats. We'd already done the work to amend the business, I mean, the management plans through to uh, Flerno to, to get so that we could actually start doing this. Um, and, uh, at any rate, um, we are, we, we've done two years now. Um, the, second, uh, the second year we, we tried to uh, um, expand on some of the tenures. 
Uh, this is where we found some more significant challenges, where the, the province takes so long to process an application, which is why we ended up going with the, the two out of the five that we had, because they were already existing tenures with management plans. And so an amendment was the easiest way for us to get, get, in, get involved. And mind you, that still took pressure from us. We had to go and meet with the uh, folks in, in, in uh, forest lands and natural resource operations and rural development. What an acronym, oh my God. So at any rate, um, um, we went there and, and you know, like most things, their hands are pretty tied. They, they, you know, as people on the ground, they, they don't have any way to tell their boss that they need help. So we take it on again and we go back to our shareholding nations to apply political pressure. The answers are yet to come. Uh, so, you know, this, this will still be a challenge, but I still think this is a huge opportunity. So some of the challenges, and uh, I'm just gonna say that, you know, the federal government really needs to provide some adequate funding, kind of like they did in PICFI. And, and so the, the PICFI uh, uh, created funds to re-engage First Nations back into a commercial fishery. So this wouldn't be going back into, but it certainly could be used to get involved in aquaculture and, and, and whatever aspect the nations want. It could be shellfish, it could be kelp, it could be fish farms, it could be land-based, could be in the ocean. It's whatever that nation wants and whatever their aspirations are. So, um, so now we need capital funds for business development in aquaculture. Um, we need funds for business development to assist with establishing partnerships with industry. Um, First Nations uh, need the province also to support by processing applications in a timely manner, because the current process, like I just said, takes way too long. And and I think that you know um, in today's world uh, we've had a government now talk about the most important relationship is the that of First Nations. They've even gone so far as to, to um, uh, create a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Declaration. Uh, they, they've created the laws for that. So, you know, what we want is that the, if the government wants to honor UNDRIP, give First Nations the decision making authority to make their own decisions on what types of aquaculture they want to have in their territories and provide the funding necessary so that the First Nations can make it happen. First Nations can provide advice and examples of how to breathe life into UNDRIP, like I just did uh, with our, our forestry one. And I'm really happy to say, you know, uh, that uh, uh, my nation has now purchased 35% of Western forest products. That was announced a couple of weeks back. So, you know, I talked about this relationship starting in the 90s. So here we are in 2021, they're still working at it. They're still working hard to maintain a relationship. Uathak, Isak, Hishuk So uh, at any rate, uh, um, I, I really wanted to, to make an emphasis today that we're sitting on a huge opportunity. And, and you know, with the blue economy strategy out there right now, another thing, that's First Nation, we've been, We've been living a blue economy since time immemorial. We were promised that access to the ocean is why we got small reserves in BC. And now that there's a blue, blue economy going out there, I'm saying, let's grab onto this. Let's, let's own it. Let's, let's breathe some life into to the UNDRIP and, and, and show what economic reconciliation looks like. Let's partner together. It's, you know, uh, if anything is taught, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's collaboration. We need to come together as people. We need to work together. At any rate, I'm going to leave it at that for now and uh, um, leave some time for any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. I really um, value what you have to say, and I look forward to sharing a meal with you in the future so we can uh, talk more about it. 
Um, I'm glad you reiterated the three principles uh, a number of times during your presentation. That was certainly a couple of the questions that popped up in the chat box. Um, I had I see that Jennifer Woodland is is with us on the call, and I was uh, sorry to call you out, Jennifer, but I was wondering if you could put them in the chat for us so that we could um, share uh, share with everyone that is interested. I think that would be meaningful because it's an important lesson that, you know, we get caught up in this busy day to day stuff all the time. And these are our principles that we should all carry with us in life. Um, and something that, that uh, as a non Indigenous person, um, I feel that's a very good reminder to how we should be living our lives. So I appreciate that. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Um, one is, how can individuals support or embrace the seven generation uh, mentality and thought process? What can we do as individuals to make sure that we're leaving the planet a better place for seven generations in the future? Well, um, I think uh, uh, by not thinking of things in silos, uh, and a forest is not just a tree, it's a forest of living things. So don't think about things in silos. You have to think about the interconnectedness of things and, and that will help help a lot. When, once you start thinking about interconnectedness and only utilizing what you need so that it's there for seven generations. And it doesn't you know, necessarily, you, you think about decisions you make on management, decisions you make on day to day, you know, uh, um, and, and try to keep those, those principles in mind, and, and it will help you. Excellent. Um, there's a question here about, uh, you, you talked about how the there's less processing facilities available um, now, as more seaweed aquaculture uh, ramps up, do you see the processing facilities being a, a barrier to, to scaling up that industry? I see it as another challenge and an opportunity. And, and it's an opportunity for someone to, to, to come and, and benefit from the hard work that others are doing right now, but all fitting into and in collaboration. Remember I was talking about coming together. I think we can, you know, if we all come together we, we can definitely help Canada come out of this pandemic in a good way by, you know, raising up aquaculture, by creating uh, uh, other revenue streams. Like That's a, a wonderful follow up to the, um, the lunch session we just had from MNP and they laid out a value chain and they said, do you need to identify what part of the value chain do you want to be in and how you can and support people on either ends of the value chain and doing that analysis. If there's a bunch of growers out there then and you don't know where you want to fit, then maybe you need to be a processor, a primary processor, or maybe you need to be in distribution or um, maybe you need to create the finished products. So I, again, that mentality of collaboration and looking to identify where the gaps are and, uh, and how we can support each other. I think that's really the theme I'm, I'm uh, learning from this, this conversation. There's another question that's come in here. Um, Larry, do you foresee a day when First Nations might own a major portion of the seafood sector in the same way that the Mi'kmaq has in the East? That's a goal that I wish for, hope for, and work towards. Uh, and, and I think, you know, BC is the place. Uh, you know, there's very little uh, treaties in British Columbia when you look at the rest of Canada. I think there's three or four. So, so there's an opportunity here. Uh, um, I, I like to, to, to not look at things like as challenges. Take those challenges and turn them into opportunities and, and see how you can help. Could you tell our audience today a little bit more about the Mi'kmaq um, agreement, how they acquired um, uh, others in the seafood sector? Uh, I, I can only imagine that it's uh, it was through relationship building and, and taking care of that relationship so that they can keep building on successes. And that, that's, that's another teaching, a First Nation teaching, building on successes. We typically are not, supposed to be bragging about anything, but I find it necessary in, in, in this modern world here that 
that we need to start to uh, acknowledge and, and the successes that we are we are having and and go out of our comfort zone and acknowledge them now. Uh, you know, it, it's in the past it was okay to to quietly go about your business and, and be successful, but now I think it's it's more important to network, to share your experience, so that others don't have to face the same challenges. On that note, could you recommend um, a couple of books or resources that our audience might uh, be interested in reading about building those relationships with, with First Nation governments or partners or communities? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I don't really know of any books. This has kind of been lifelong teachings for myself. I mean, I've always uh, thought that you could, uh, the fastest way to uh, um, uh, Good business is to partner with somebody who's already doing it because then you don't have to invent the wheel. And uh, there's, I think there's enough out there that we can share the successes and, and, and build on them. That's wonderful. Well, I, I think uh, that's probably all the time we have um, for this particular session. And I really value the time that you took to share with us rather spontaneously today too, which was, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad that, uh, that uh, you were able to join us. It's very meaningful. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so is that it for me then? That's it for you, except for uh, growing more seaweed and uh, farming more seafood. Fantastic, I'm all in for that. and. Uh... Have a great day, everyone, and be kind to each other. More importantly, be kind to yourself. Chu, Tlako. Hi,